Uh, what I'm presenting on today is going to be mental arousal and the relationship with performance. Um, everyone knows that uh, the mind is an important thing when it comes to athletics, but a uh, few people know the relationship or a little scientific points behind it. So through this presentation, we're just going to go over a brief basics of the relationship, go into a few theories, and go into a little bit of application. So next slide. Uh, first off, we got the definition of arousal. It's basically a physiological and a psychological state of being awake or reactive to a stimuli. Basically, it involves the body being um, activated and go a little further. It involves the activation of the systems of the body leading to increased heart rate, blood pressure, and condition of sensory alertness, mobility, and readiness to respond. Basically, this could be um, anything. Oh, oh, sorry, quick. <laughs> Arousal could be anything caused by someone walking in the door, someone yelling at you, uh, the environment around you. Anything can really cause a state of arousal. It's what we're looking at is the level of arousal that would be optimal. We'll go into that a little later. Next is uh, well, the definition of performance uh, the accomplishment of a given task measured against uh, present known standards of accuracy, completeness, cost, and speed. Basically, that's self-explanatory. Um, in the realm of athletics, performance is either going to be in a athletic skill test or in a game. Um, those are pretty much the two levels of performance. The rest, like training, everything like that, is going to be more preparation for that performance. Okay, next slide. Uh, arousal and performance. Um, basically, the relationship is uh, arousal is a major aspect in learning theories and it's closely related to other concepts such as a uh, bunch of uh, psych psycho psychological uh, traits. Uh, then we got arousal levels can be thought as how much capacity you have available to work with it. Um, basically, this is more of a state that arousal really has a lot to do with performance. Um, and really, in more sense, this slide is over preparation. Because in preparation, you're learning. And if you do not have, if arousal is not the right state, learning can't really work as best as it could. Uh, next slide. <coughs> okay. Uh, Yerkes and Dawson, they basically did some studies uh, back in the early 1900, and they came up with the inverted view uh, shape of between relationship between arousal and performance. On the bottom, you got levels of arousal, uh, straight vertical, you got quality of performance. And uh, this came across in 1908. It's still around, used, and has you know, been scientifically proven for today's use. Um, just go on a brief overview. The low end uh, is basically you got low amount of arousal. And then you increase an optimum around optimum around optimum level of arousal will be some about in the middle and that's when your performance is going to be at your highest. Now, once you go past too far, uh, too far of that level, your arousal gets a little out of hand, and therefore your performance goes down. This can be seen as someone getting over anxious, um, over hyped, and as a result, lose focus on what you're supposed to do during the performance. Uh, next slide. Um, Come back to this one because you're gonna get more. Next one? Yeah, next one. Okay. Actually, you're back. Sorry about that. You're fine. Okay, I get the word of this down. Okay, uh, basically, what I was saying earlier a uh, certain amount of arousal can be a motivator towards change. We all know that. Uh, but too much or too little will work against the learner. If you're on the low end or high end, it can be detrimental to you. So, We'll go on a little later that it is important that a person finds out their personal optimum level of uh, arousal or 
focus or hype, however you want to put it, um, that they can perform at their best. And uh, yeah, next slide. Going to a little bit into task complexity. This has a big factor to do with uh, <coughs> arousal levels. Now, if you're doing a complex task, let's say you're playing chess or an athletic setting, you're doing golf. It's got fine skills to it. It takes a lot of accuracy. So, being overly, you know, excited about it or over amped about it, what's that really going to do? It's going to take your focus off of the small details you need to focus on. You narrow up your fo focus is going to narrow. Therefore, you won't be able to perform. Now, with simple tasks, this refers more to weightlifting. All right. Now, if you aren't ready to lift 500 pounds off the floor, if you're not overly, your body and mind isn't overly prepared for that state, the chances of you completing that type of task is diminished. So, the whole point is this, that arousal will uh, be fluctuating in the middle, but with complex tasks, it's going to be more towards the low end. And with simple tasks, like weightlifting, it's going to be more towards the high end. Now, there still is that drop-off point, but there is fluctuation. That's all this graph said. All uh, right, next slide. Uh, so why does arousal influence performance? Arousal increases muscle tension and affects coordination. Too much tension can create difficulties as well as affect tension. Basically, for running, for example, if you got, you want a guy to be relaxed. Now, in the track meet, if the guy is overly excited and he's going to be going, coming into the blocks tense, and if he fires out and he's all tense, his muscles can't relax, they can't be efficient in the running portion, and therefore it's going to be detrimental to him. Uh, however, uh, attention can become too narrow with uh, too much arousal. It can make uh, one pay attention too much in their environment when there is too little arousal. Basically, all that's saying is that with low levels of arousal, your uh, attention focus products. You can see basically everything in the room. Now with high levels of arousal, let's say it's a fight, uh, fight or flight situation where you know someone's coming at you, you're facing a defender or something like that. The focus is going to be narrow on what's threatening you the most. So you're not going to be able to notice maybe someone running past you or something like that because your focus is on the guy that's the, or the situation that's most threatening to your well-being. All right, next slide. So, why does this matter? Well, you don't take arousal into consideration in a preparation process. Basically, uh, the athlete will never be able to, sorry, uh, fully get used to their certain level of, uh, you know, they got to prepare in the level that they perform best. We have all heard the saying, Practice like it's a game, but there is some truth in that. You do not uh, practice with the same state or the same uh, same state of alertness while, as you would be in the game. Then competition will suffer because the standards increase. Um, so basically, why does it matter? Yeah, uh, for practice, you know, playing at your optimal level of arousal so you can compete in your optimal level of arousal. Uh, next slide. So, with football, uh, this is differing between positions. You will get a quarterback. He's got a lot of responsibilities. He's got to see the whole field. So, to have him all amped up back in that pocket, he's going to miss wide receivers running. He's going to miss reads. Basically, his performance is going to go down. He's got to be calm, cool, and collected in the pocket for his performance to be optimal. Now, at a different position like offensive line, yes, there are responsibilities with holes and everything like that, but he does, you know, his level has to be higher because comparative task is a lot simpler. 
All he has to do is block someone, read the defense, and make his blocks. So there would be differing uh, levels of uh, arousal and to get them at their highest performance. Now, here's a little example, same position. Now, back at Baylor, these two wide receivers, the guy on the right, that's Terrence Williams. The guy on the left, that's Tevin Reese. Now, both play wide receiver. Both are really good. Both have, yes. I have a question. Could an offensive lineman arousal pick change by play? Yep. Because of an offense, if I'm pass blocking, I don't want to be as aggressive. Yeah. But if I'm run blocking, but not be one of the a little more aggressive. So could that change from oh, play to play with? You know, yes, it could change. During the game, I'm not saying this is like a standard that it has to be yeah. up at this level or this level. Yeah. It's just that it will fluctuate, mm -hmm. but average, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a offensive lineman have a higher level or else than a quarterback. That's all I was trying to do yeah. with that. Um, but yeah, going into this point is that these guys both have different levels of arousal. Now you got Terrence over there, Basically, he uh, works the best when he's calm out there. You know, he's not talking too much. He basically is asleep. You know, that's his optimum level of arousal. Now, that's totally different than Ted. Now, he's amped up, jumping all over the place, talking this and that. And shoot, he has the best game of his life. Two guys, different levels of arousal, both of optimum performance. All right. Next slide. Uh, how to apply. Basically, educate your staff and players. Now, if your staff does not realize what you're trying to do with guys being in their optimum level of uh, function or their zone, if you want to put it, then they'll see a guy that's being all calm as he's not trying hard. He's not, you know, giving it all, you know. And so if you do not educate your staff, you can't really use this at all. You can't get a guy <coughs> to work on being in his zone. Now educate the players too. You know, it goes into the third one too. It's self-examination. You educate the players to where they can, you know, examine what's going on inside, you know, compared to their performance, then they'll have a better opportunity to actually get to that state because they know, hey, I perform better when I'm calm or, you know what, I perform a lot better when I'm really excited or I'm really amped up. And finally, it would be create an environment. You know, uh, probably the best for a team situation is that you would need to create an environment that will simulate the level of arousal that they'll see in a stadium or something like that. Now, that's hard to do. Um, the different ways of doing it, but in a strength conditioning setting, it's basically in the weight room, cranking up the music so they can't really talk to each other because a few home games, yes, you can talk to each other, but away games, big stadiums, you're not going to be able to communicate. So if you're not used to not communicating with the guy next to you and using body language, then you're going to suffer in your performance. Um, now, with practice, you know, and just regular practice, what you can do to simulate that situation, have a lot of bunch of speakers, put on crowd noise, throw in the visiting uh, rival song, something like that. You know, certain things that could get them <coughs> stimulated to what they're actually going to face on Saturdays. All right, next slide this is probably reference slide. Yes, this is reference slide. But in conclusion, basically. You want to have your players know how to get in a certain zone so they can perform at their highest level. Um, without them knowing that, or the coaches knowing what level or what is their zone, it would be hard to get a guy ready to uh, or prepared to compete on Saturdays, Sundays, whenever they play. And this does not just apply to football. It applies to all sports. But uh, it is a uh, very important topic. Uh, and that was just a brief overview of that. You can go into more depth in the theories and everything like that. But that's just a brief overview. So any questions? Yo, yeah, what's up? Uh,
go back to that yerk study 